클릭해 주셔서 감사합니다. Road View Redesigned Mr. Road View Does anyone know where the port side is? Ooh, a few of you know. Port is left. If you didn't know that, you can remember that because left has four letters. Port also has four letters. So if port is left, then starboard is right. Right. Very good. I'm glad I have such a smart audience today. Now, on our starboard side currently, in the central waterfront, we have the Seattle Great Wheel. Tall white circle. Was the tallest observation deck in the U.S. until Las Vegas built a bigger one, because of course they did, they're Las Vegas. <laughs> now, after kind of a larger break between the piers, there's going to be a dark blue building. This is our famous Seattle Aquarium. The reason I love our Seattle Aquarium is because the main focus is on local wildlife, research, rehabilitation of injured animals, and educating the public. They don't really have trained animal acts. They're not out there doing tricks. But there is one animal that has a neat training at Hecat. Mishka, the sea otter, is the world's only sea otter that was known to develop asthma and definitely the only sea otter that was trained to self-administer asthma medication. She does that by beeping her nose on a button that administers it to her when she needs it. Of course, aside from our furry friends, we also have creatures in the deep, like a giant Pacific octopus, which is the largest species of octopus in the world. It gets fed every day at 4 p.m. What you don't find in our aquarium is flying fish. Do any of you know where to go to see fish fly in this town? That's right, it's Pike Place Market. And I'm not talking about the species, I'm talking about the fish booth where employees throw fish to each other. Good news is they donate the fish that they touch to the aquarium. You'll get fresh fish while you're there. We can see the back end of Pike Place. If you look above these beige apartments, there is a seafoam green terminal with a red and silver balcony at an angle. That is the far north end of Pike Place. Any of you been there yet? A few people. Doesn't surprise me that at least a handful of you did because that is the number one most visited and most photographed spot in all of Seattle. But it didn't start as a tourist attraction. It started over a little bit of local onion outrage. See, Seattle being the gateway to Alaska means that when the Alaskan Gold Rush started, a ton of businessmen came to town in that period. And they had a nasty little habit. They would buy up all the produce before your average Joe could go grocery shopping and hike the prices way up. It got to the point where a pound of onions cost roughly the same as a new pair of shoes at the time. People were not too happy about that. So Pike Place Market started so consumers could meet producers directly, get fresh stuff for fair prices, everything from flowers to flying fish. And that fish booth is now employee owned. Now, while we do have a lot of stuff to see here in town, some people also visit us in the summer in order to get out of town on a luxury cruise. The really colorful terminal we're coming up on on the starboard side, orange, red, turquoise, blue, was the first luxury cruise ship terminal that we ever built. It's about 19 years young. Now, we are not the busiest cruise ship terminal, it's true. Places like Florida do get more ships coming through. But here's the thing, folks. What kind of places do you go on a cruise from Florida? Tropical places, right? You know the Beach Boys song, Jamaica, Bahama, come on, pretty long. Well, in Seattle, we don't have that luxury. We are on the Pacific Ocean, so we go places like Alaska and Canada. What is Alaska like in, say, December? Cold, frigid, it is freezing. So you don't really want to be on top of a cruise ship going down a water slide in December in Alaska. We can only really run our cruises from about May to October. Despite a really short season, we had more than 218 ships leave our port last year, so we're about number four in terms of busyness. Now, one ship alone will usually bring our city around $2.6 million just from being here around a day. That's because people come here for a cruise, probably want to grab a bite to eat, buy some cool souvenirs like a bobblehead. 
or they will want to sleep off their jet lag. Of all the hotels in Seattle, the one that's closest to the cruise ship terminal is also the only one that is literally on the water. That is our Hotel Edgewater in this light blue and mustard yellow building that has the lit up red E on top. The Hotel Edgewater was built for the same event that the Space Needle was in 1962. Do any of you know what that event was? You are correct, my friend. It was the World Fair. And the World Fair was not just a little tiny local event. It was a six-month event showcasing all the latest technology in the world, and millions of people visited Seattle. Uh, of the millions of people who visited, the number who stayed at the Hotel Edgewater for the fair was zero, because they didn't get it done on time. That was a pretty big bummer. But they came up with a pretty clever marketing scheme. They became the only hotel where you could fish from your window. That lasted for a couple decades, but consider this. Fishing is not a very clean sport. If you reel a fish into your hotel room, you've got to figure out what to do with it. So hotel staff were finding fish in bathtubs, tucked into bed, hidden under carpets. They weren't too pleased, so that practice was banned in the 80s. However, they are still a pretty popular hotel because of a guest they had in 1964. That was a British band called The Beatles. They also have had celebrities like David Bowie, Ozzy Osbourne, the members of ACDC and Pearl Jam stay there, cementing its reputation as our rock and roll hotel. However, if you stay in the Beatles suite, you will not be able to touch anything that the Beatles touched, because as soon as they left, the hotel staff cut up everything and sold it. Now there are only a couple more piers that make up our central waterfront. This newer pier that has the white building on top is where the Port of Seattle operates. They handle traffic both on the sea and in the air. The very last pier in blue and red is a much older pier. It's one of the last fully wooden piers. Some of those have been around since 1902. And inside of this building, at one point, we had the Washington State Liquor and Control Board. Ironically, there is now an Irish pub in Pier 70. But Pier 70 is also a chance to start getting ready for your Space Needle selfies. Because once we clear this pier and a couple apartment buildings, we'll have our closest view from the water. You are welcome to move around the boat if you so desire. Just remember that out here on the seas, we can rock around. So always be cautious as you do that. more about the space mill specs when we're further out in the water. But while you're enjoying that close-up view, I also want to touch on the park that's down here in front of it on the waterfront. This is Olympic Sculpture Park. It's maintained by the Seattle Art Museum, but no need to buy a ticket. You can just walk up and enjoy it for free. And the red spiky sculpture at the very far east end of the park is meant to represent a beloved local animal that is surprisingly plentiful in Washington State. So I'll just give you a second to look at that red spiky sculpture and try to guess what that animal is. All right, so that animal is supposed to be a bald eagle, folks. Washington has the second most bald eagles in the U.S., only behind Alaska. And if you don't think it looks like a bald eagle, come on, artist objective. Now there's a more literal bald eagle sculpture coming up here in our next park. This park is Myrtle Edwards. It's named after a city councilwoman who in the 50s and 60s made sure Seattle would have a ton of neighborhood parks. Now we have more city parks than any other city in the US. As we clear this line of trees, there's gonna be an office building with a globe on top and a bald eagle up on top of that. We can only see the word but back when it spun, you could see that it says it's in the PI. PI is short for Post Intelligencer. That was Seattle's first newspaper ever, opening up in 1863. In 1863, Washington was not even a state yet. This was still unincorporated Northwest Territory. And the Post Intelligencer is still around, but not in that office. 
Little thing happened in 2007 called the recession. Hit them pretty hard. So they had to keep moving into smaller offices, and you can't really put a three-ton globe in your U-Haul. So that globe is going to stick around as a historic landmark, and eventually it'll be restored to spin once again. If you're looking for more Seattle historic landmarks, then the place you probably want to go is going to be our Museum of History and Industry. But that is not here on our saltwater. It's on one of our freshwater lakes, Lake Union. You could get to Lake Union if you made a giant leap over this hill that has those TV towers that are partially obscured by clouds. This hill itself is one of our older neighborhoods. Way back when, it was called Eden Hill. The original inhabitants of this area, the Duwamish Nation, didn't really live in Eden Hill. For one, the Duwamish people usually tried to have their settlements closer to shore. Secondly, Eden Hill was really, really steep, so it was just difficult to move up there. Even when white settlers started appearing in the area, they didn't really want to go up Eden Hill because of that physical difficulty. But a couple things happened that made them want to go up the hill and possible to go up the hill. What made it possible was electric rail cars. So you didn't have to get that calf workout trying to hook it up the hill. And then with the Seattle Great Fire of 1889, the downtown area was thrown into chaos. So they wanted to get out of there and into a different area. So they took those electric rail cars up Eden Hill and built Queen Anne style mini mansions. Thus, this neighborhood is now called Queen Anne Hill. Some of you may be familiar with that name if you watch shows like Cheers, Frasier, or Grey's Anatomy. If you're a Frasier fan, I'm afraid you would not be able to find his apartment on Queen Anne because most of that show was filmed in California. However, for my Grey's Anatomy fans, the first couple seasons featured the residence house. And the house used for its exterior shots does exist on Queen Anne, not far from Cary Park. Cary Park is often called Postcard Park because it's the, of its views of the downtown area. But here on the west side of Queen Anne, obviously it's a much more industrial view. This gray and red ship is a bulk carrier. That means they don't pack their cargo into boxes and containers. It just gets put right into the ship's hull or bottom shell. The cargo that this is loading up with is Seattle's second largest export, both by revenue and volume. Our first largest is airplanes and airplane parts. We are home to Boeing, so it's a pretty big deal. But our second largest is, in fact, cow food. Cattle grade grain. The stuff you feed cows and not your kids. And it's true, we don't grow it here. It does come from the Midwest, and it comes over here on train. The reason we store it here is because we are the closest U.S. port to Hong Kong outside of Alaska, which it's much more difficult to leave with cargo. If you started a race to Hong Kong from Long Island, California, and Seattle, Washington, we would win by about 24 hours. You can see on our starboard side now, there are 64 grain silos. They hold several million bushels. But to the left of the silos, there's something that's part of more familiar industry, which is the tech industry. If you look past these trees, there's a blue and white curved structure. To the left of that, there's gray and white campus. Back in the day, this was home to Amgen, the world's largest biotech company. But for the past couple years, Expedia has been moving in. I say couple years, these yellow cranes have been around here since I started at Argosy in 2017. Expedia is not just Expedia, it also owns a ton of subsidiaries. If you've ever used Hotels.com, Booking.com, Travelocity, Zivago, the list goes on and on. You booked it, they probably own it. So their hope when they're done with these renovations is to have a campus fit for 10,000 employees. Now, Seattle is experiencing a huge tech boom, but one industry that has 
always been around and is probably around to stay is the fishing industry. The beige terminal on our starboard side is the oldest pier on Elliott Bay and also home to American Seafood Company. And while you're here, I recommend downloading an app called Seafood Watch. That will tell you where sustainable seafood can be bought. We have to share our fish with our local wildlife, such as our beloved orca. The residential orcas of Puget Sound are pretty unique. While most of the orcas of the world will eat just about anything in the sea, our resident orcas will only eat Chinook salmon. So in order to make sure that both us, the people, and them, the orca, can have enough fish, Seafood Watch is your guide. The dark gray terminal there is probably um, where some of you might go this summer if you're taking a luxury cruise. That is our overflow cruise ship terminal. And we do have this large luxury cruise liner ahead of us, and we're putting it on our starboard side. It's close enough that you can really make out those water slides up top. This is a Carnival cruise ship. And I believe this cruise ship is gonna be able to have more than 4,000 passengers on it. That's the size of some small towns in Washington State. Cruise ships like these often will also have things like several restaurants, several bars, sometimes a recreational center, a gym, a theater, and some of them even have their own personal boat jail called a brig. ship is going to be heading out to the Pacific Ocean. That's around a 12-hour journey for some ships. It can be more like nine hours for faster ships. The Puget Sound is so named a sound because it has two openings to get to the ocean. That's the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the Strait of Georgia. But to get to either of those, you have to weave through bunches and bunches of islands. There are around 300 of them. The closest one to this point of Seattle is the lake you can see just a little bit of in the horizon. That is Bainbridge. Bainbridge is the third largest and also has a cool downtown area where you can explore European delis, bakeries, an art shop, theater, and for my Grey's Anatomy fans, it's also where the actor who played McDreamy lives. turn our ship just a little bit so that when we get those wakes from that very large ship, it's an easier walk for us. Out here at this point in the water too, we have another clear view of the Space Nail, just a little bit further out. From here, the Space Nail looks pretty massive. But the fact of the matter is that the Space Nail today is only the seventh tallest building in Seattle. It's 605 feet tall, and looking at our skyline, you'll see that it has a pretty unique shape. Most skyscrapers will be cubical or conical, but the Space Needle looks like a spaceship on knitting needles. It also only has five operating stories.
and something happened to crack the inner hull, then the fuel would just flood the outer hull instead of getting out in the water. If any of you remember the Valdez oil spill a while back, that was ecologically a disaster, and we really want to prevent stuff like that from happening again. Thus, the double holes. As we turn right, we are entering the eastern waterway of the Duwamish River. And there's also an example of one of those bunker barges with a tractor tugboat tied up to it. Now, this tractor tugboat's wheelhouse is very tall up. It kind of looks like a giraffe of a tugboat. That means that this tugboat can push its cargo from behind, and the captain can still see out past it. But this zone of the waterway is also where most of our shipping happens. And you timed it pretty well, folks. You got here when we do have some ships docked at the pier. So you're gonna get to see just how huge these ships are. Now the shipping industry has been really revolutionized in the past few decades. It used to be a painfully slow process. If any of you remember the opening scene of the Titanic, there was a ton of crew. And all this crew was running around, loading up the boat with small boxes, barrels, bags. A lot of manpower, a lot of time. A ship as small as ours probably would have taken two weeks to load up way back when. Now, a ship the size as the MSC on our starboard side usually will be in and out of port in two days or less. That's because we now have standardized shipping boxes. That's what's stacked up all around us. And we have these huge gantry cranes that can move a box in about a minute and a half. So rather than playing Tetris with small cargo, we stack Legos with big boxes. We also keep things fairly balanced by having around 55% of the cargo below decks where we can't see. They're also probably going to prioritize heavy stuff on the bottom. But the shipping industry is not the only industry that flourishes in this zone. What's currently on our port side that we will put on our starboard side in a moment is a brick clock tower. That brick clock tower has an American flag on top and between the clock and the flag is a familiar green siren. This brick building is the international headquarters of Starbucks Coffee. I'm sure most of us have probably heard of that company. Starbucks currently has 25,000 shops in 70 countries around the world. 200 of those shops are just within Seattle city limits. 60 are just in the downtown area. Despite being a massive company now, Starbucks started off as a little mom and pop shop in Pike Place Market in the 1970s. This is also an era when America had not yet discovered espresso. It was still just an Italian thing. But once Starbucks got America interested in espresso, we started to have cappuccinos, frappuccinos, mochas, lattes, you name it. But Starbucks is not even our, our, our only coffee company. You can also find a ton of independent roasters. I recommend a roaster like uh, Espresso Vivace. <laughs> Those bath toys led to one of the most comprehensive studies of the world's ocean currents ever conducted. An oceanographer asked people to report the serial number of the ducky that washed up on their shore. And that oceanographer got reports from Washington, Oregon, California, at least back then. But also places like New Zealand, Australia, Belfast, and places all over the world. That data was compiled in a book that's kind of dry, but it has a fun title. It's called Moby Duck. Now some of our important ocean goers are based out of the Coast Guard in the Coast Guard Puget Sound sector here on our starboard side. This base also guards the largest stretch of water out of any Coast Guard base in the U.S. One of the main ships we can see at dock is this huge white and red one. Unlike some of their patrol cutters that do things like search and rescue, war on drugs, war on terrorism, 
the Healy here has a more unique function. The Healy's purpose is to go to the Arctic. It often will do supply drops, and it can crush around 20 feet of ice. They crush the ice using just their weight. Now these are some of the most powerful boats in the entire world. Russia did for a time operate nuclear-powered icebreakers, but currently, from last I heard, they are under repair. So these are going to be some of just about the most powerful ships you could find anywhere on the globe. They also will have around 12 diesel engines on board, and room to carry 1 million gallons of fuel. While you could circumnavigate the globe with that much diesel, the primary purpose of that is just to make it heavier, so it crushes ice better. What's past the Coast Guard Station is our stadium district. Our stadiums used to be just one. We had the Kingdome, where pretty much all of our sports teams played. But due to infrastructural failure, we exploded the Kingdom and built some shiny new stadiums. The dark gray one is T-Mobile Park, formerly known as Safeco Field. That is where our baseball team, the Seattle Mariners, play. There's a saying in this town, which is true to the blue for our loyalty to the Mariners. One of the places we best demonstrated that was in the price of T-Mobile Park, which was $517 million. With it being expensive and having a retractable roof, I kind of think of it as Seattle's midlife crisis as we bought a convertible. The next stadium in white and blue is CenturyLink Field. That is home to two sports teams, our American football team and our soccer team. The soccer team is the Seattle Sounders, and between 2013 and 2018, their average attendance was over 42,000 people. Our American football team are the ones responsible for 12 just being all over Seattle. If you've ever wondered why you see that number so much, it's because of the 12th man. While 11 football players are down on the field facing the elements, the 12th man likes to imagine that it's his enthusiasm that carries the team to victory. The combination of the 12th man's enthusiasm and the shape of CenturyLink has led to some scientific intrigue. CenturyLink Field only covers the audience, not the center where the players are. So they're exposed to the elements. And what it also led to was sound being bounced off the roof into the center of the field. So it gets amplified. In 2011, when Marshawn Lynch made a 67-yard touchdown, the combination of fans screaming and losing their minds and the amplification of that field led to what we call the beast quake. We generated a 2.2 magnitude earthquake with our sound. We made another earthquake when the Queen visited. And I'm not talking about the Queen of England, I am talking about Beyonce during the single ladies dance. If you yourself are a single lady, you to visit Smith Tower if you're looking for someone to put a ring on. We can see Smith Tower closer now. We saw it a bit earlier. It's this beige building with the pyramid. While today it's pretty dwarfed by other skyscrapers, what it does still have is something called the wishing chair. Legend has it, if a single lady sits in the wishing chair, within a year, the love of her life will propose to her. If you don't believe that because you're not superstitious, well, it worked for Smith's daughter, as well as two Argosy employees, so don't knock until you try it. Our tallest skyscraper today is the Black Tower to the left of the Smith Tower. That is the Columbia Center. It has the world's tallest Starbucks. Don't be misled by the one in the lobby, you do have to get in the elevator. And also a ladies restroom with views many, many hundreds of feet in the air. Now don't worry, you can see out, but it's high enough up there that no one can see in. To the left of the Columbia Center, the shiny zigzag building, get a lot of questions about that. That is the F5 Tower. A very convenient name because it's the fifth tallest in Seattle. But looking back down on the waterfront, we have this terminal where there are green features, this beige booth with the green roof. 
That is where our Washington State ferries dock. Our Washington State ferries are double-ended, so they don't technically have a front or back. They have propellers on both sides and wheelhouses on both sides, so you can always just take off and go wherever you're docked. Short for walk from that, we have the Washington uh, Fast Ferry Terminal, and we do see a fast ferry going to dock right now with this orange wheelhouse. In front of them, there's a beige terminal. Pier 54 features something called Ye Old Curiosity Shop. Since it is a store, it's free to enter, but you can see curiosities such as